The strangest meeting in history between a president and a deputy attorney general took place today on Air Force One. It was a meeting that President Trump scheduled specifically to set up a competing television event on the day that Christine Blasey Ford presented her accusations about Brett Kavanaugh to the Judiciary Committee. That's what it was originally scheduled. The strategy seemed to be to try to draw cameras away from what the White House expected to be a damaging hearing for Brett Kavanaugh. But there was a genuine sense of urgency about the meeting the president wanted to have with Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein, because Rod Rosenstein was then publicly struggling to deny a story in the New York Times saying that early in the Trump administration, Rod Rosenstein discussed trying to assemble evidence to be used in convincing the vice president and the cabinet to remove President Trump from power by using the process authorized in the 25th Amendment. And Rod Rosenstein in that story was quoted as being willing to wear a wire, possibly himself, to record the president, to gather evidence against the president. Speculation was then running high that the president would use the meeting that was scheduled for the same time as the Kavanaugh hearing to fire Rod Rosenstein and force TV attention to shift to the theatrical drama of Rod Rosenstein arriving at the White House and then leaving the White House and perhaps the president then making a statement about the firing, but the president canceled that meeting and decided to watch the hearing on TV like the rest of us. The meeting was rescheduled for today on an airplane, which couldn't be more ironic because of this. Bill Clinton gets into the back of an airplane for 39 minutes just prior to a determination being made, but gets on with the attorney general because he happened to be in Arizona playing golf. It was 110 degrees out, right? Nobody saw him on the golf course. Just happened to be there. Oh, there's the attorney general. Let me get back on the plane. So they spent 39 minutes in the back of the plane. They talked about two things, golf and grandchildren. 39 minutes. So I give the grandchildren five minutes. I give the golf three minutes, right? What else do you think might have been talked about? Well, you know the president didn't talk about the grandchildren today. As a candidate for president, Donald Trump and every Republican considered it an outrage that a former president of the United States would meet with a current attorney general over whom the former president had absolutely no power. And they found something extra conspiratorial in the fact that the meeting occurred on an airplane and the fact that Bill Clinton's private plane landed in the same place as the attorney general's plane. Today, Donald Trump met on an airplane with the deputy attorney general who is investigating him, investigating him. Rod Rosenstein is the supervising special, he's the supervisor of the special prosecutor, of supervisor of Robert Mueller's investigation. So Rod Rosenstein is in, in effect the highest level working prosecutor in the Justice Department. And he's supervising the prosecutor who's investigating the president of the United States. So the Justice Department official who has the ultimate control over the investigation of the president met with the president today to try to convince him that he was not part of a plot to use the 25th Amendment to remove him from power and that he didn't suggest the possibility of he himself wearing a wire to record either demented or criminal language by the president that could then be used to convince the vice president and the cabinet to remove the president from power. That is the strangest meeting that has ever occurred in the history of the United States of America between a president and a member of the Justice Department. Here's what reporters got from the president about that meeting after Air Force One landed today. The press wants to know, what did you talk about? <laughs> but we had a very good talk, I will say it. That became a very big story, actually, folks. We had a good talk. We just had a very nice talk. We actually get along. And a uh, really good talk. Yeah, I'm not doing anything. I'm doing So I'm not, I don't want to do anything about that. I'm not making any changes. You'd be the first to know. I'm not making any changes, though. The not making any changes is when he was asked if he was firing Red Rosenstein or anyone else in the Justice Department. The president decided today that defending his campaign and himself against the charges of colluding with Russia was not enough. It was time to accuse the Democrats of colluding with Russia. Everybody understands there was no collusion, there's no Russia. It was all made up by the Democrats. They're the ones that colluded with Russia. The Democrats colluded with Russia. As the president was telling that lie, 
The New York Times was reporting new details on the Mueller investigation. The Times reports a top Trump campaign official requested proposals in 2016 from an Israeli company to create fake online identities to use social media manipulation and to gather intelligence to help defeat Republican primary race opponents and Hillary Clinton, according to interviews and copies of the proposals. The Trump campaign's interest in the work began as Russians were escalating their effort to aid Donald J. Trump. Though the Israeli company's pitches were narrower than Moscow's interference campaign and appear unconnected, the documents show that a senior Trump aide saw the promise of a disruption effort to swing voters in Mr. Trump's favor. Investigators working for Robert S. Mueller III have obtained copies of the proposals and questioned the Israeli company's employees. According to the Times, the Trump aide who requested the proposals was Rick Gates, who pleaded guilty in the Mueller investigation in February and has been cooperating with prosecutors. And the Wall Street Journal is reporting that a Republican operative secretly raised $100,000 from donors in an effort to obtain what he believed were Hillary Clinton's emails before the 2016 election, what the Wall Street Journal called, quote, activities that remain of intense interest to federal investigators working for special counsel Robert Mueller's office and on Capitol Hill. And with only 29 days to go until Election Day, Axios is reporting. Chief of Staff John Kelly recently formed a small working group to start preparing for the possibility that Democrats will soon put Congress top investigators on Trump world. Senior White House staff have an off-site weekend retreat scheduled for late October. The agenda is expected to include a discussion of investigations under a Democratic-controlled House. Joining our discussion now, Joyce Vance, former U.S. attorney for the Northern District of Alabama and a professor at the University of Alabama School of Law. Also joining us, David Frum, a senior editor for The Atlantic and author of Trumpocracy, The Corruption of the American Republic. And Max Boot, senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations and the author of the new book, The Corrosion of Conservatism, Why I Left the Right. Uh, and Max, I'd like to start with you tonight with the president deciding to, it's time to just change his defense from there was no collusion to the Democrats colluded with Russia. <laughs> this is the old no puppet, you're the puppet defense. Yeah. I mean, it's preposterous, Lawrence. It doesn't make any sense. And yet it has been strangely convincing to a large section, at least of the Republican electorate. I mean, the way Republicans have gone along with these fairy tales that Donald Trump tells his obfuscation, his attempts to obstruct justice. I mean, this is one of the major reasons. I'm not a Republican anymore. I mean, I can imagine Republicans making compromises with Trump on certain areas and saying, okay, I'm going to over overlook a few deranged tweets if I'm going to get tax cuts or Supreme Court justices. But how do you overlook the fact that he fired the FBI director and has been engaged in nonstop obstruction of justice, even as senior aide after senior aide has been found guilty of felonies? I mean, imagine what these Republicans would be saying if this were happening to Hillary Clinton. It's outrageous, and I don't know who to be more outraged about, whether the fact that you're seeing this kind of behavior from Trump or that all these Republicans who claim to be the law and order party, they're excusing it and they're enabling it. It's just r disgusting. I, I mean, I, I have to say, it's, it seems to me that uh, the outrage should be maybe double for the people who are enabling it, because Donald Trump is only one person. Uh, Joyce Vance, I, I, I want to go to the, the Rick Gates element of the news tonight, which is so fascinating, is we see in this the Trump campaign trying to make uh, some explorations, earlier explorations possibly, uh, this time involving Israelis, about how to manipulate social media, how to work this, uh, this part of the world to their advantage. And Rick Gates uh, seems to be the person who knows that story. This is an interesting development, and Mueller seems to hold a lot of cards here because he has Rick Gates as his cooperating witness, someone who can lead him through the story. You, you know, on its face, this is not what we think of as an illegal campaign contribution. This, if the reporting were to be borne out, would be the Trump campaign engaging, paying for the services of an Israeli company. And although it could possibly be illegal in some way, it's not a campaign finance violation. But we know that George Nader, who is acting as an emissary for the Saudi princes, made a $2 million payment to Joel Zamel, who ran Psy Group, the Israeli company, after the election. And if it turns out that that was a payment that was made for the campaign, then all sorts of campaign finance violations could be possible. 
and Rick Gates, who was right in the middle of it, can tell Bob Mueller exactly what happened. And uh, David, from uh, in the midst of all of this, of course, there's the New York Times story about the Trump right. family uh, tax schemes and tax evasion schemes, intergenerational over time. I want to listen to something the president said about that today uh, when he was asked, because he has famously declared that at some point in his adulthood, uh, his father gave him a million dollars, and that's it. That was his meager start in life. Uh, and we've since discovered that he had been given a million dollars by his father uh, when he was a, a little boy. Uh, uh, but let's listen to what Donald Trump said today uh, in, in when he faced questions about this. Uh, very well documented. Very well documented. Yeah, it's been documented for many years. Very well. All public documents. Not at all. Not at all. David, from uh, the answer has gone from, oh, he gave me a million dollars once to uh, just refusing to answer the question and pretending it's been very well documented. Um, it's gone from defamatory, uh, libelous, to um, inappropriate, to old news, to no big deal at all. Um, as we listen to all the stories, do, do you remember that children's game, Duck, Duck, Goose, where you go around the, the, the group of kids? Um, with so many areas of Trump, there's possible crime, possible crime, possible crime. Here, this is goose. Um, it's actual crime. If you falsify invoices in order to deceive tax authorities, that's a crime. Um, and that's what the Times so credibly um, reported that the Trump family has done. Now, in this case, it happened outside the statute of limitations. And maybe they did it for half a century and then stopped and never did it again. But maybe not. Maybe the patterns of half a century continued. And I think, you know, as, as fr I think many people who watch your program, I think all of us who appear on it get frustrated that things happen, things happen, and we seem to be in a world of spin and not realities. But when you have in the pages of a, America's leading newspaper a very credible allegation of an actual crime, and when there's a new house that re assumes the work of investigation, I think suddenly we meet realities. There is going to have to be a special counsel to look at the question, is the President of the United States at present committing tax crimes? Yeah, and, and Max, uh, the, the, the President was <clears throat> uh, asked recently, uh, White House press secretary was asked, is he still being audited? Because that was the big lie during the campaign. It's the never ending audit. I, I can't show you the returns. They're being audited. That was, of course, a lie. There was, he never showed the evidence that he was being audited, which he could have. Everyone who's being audited gets an audit letter. He refused to do that. Uh, and so uh, the, the President, I, I'm sure, was kind of thrilled with a couple of weeks where all the attention was on someone else. All the attention was on Brett Kavanaugh. And I think he was also thrilled that all the attention was on sexual assault allegations against another man right. uh, who he was hoping would survive those. Uh, and, and, and yet every time something like that happens, every time there's a big turn in the news on something, as soon as it's over, it's back to the potential and past crimes of Donald Trump. And there's a good reason for, for, uh, there's a good reason for that, Lawrence, which is that Donald Trump is the most unethical and dishonest president in the history of the United States. And every single week, we get more details about just how unethical and dishonest he is, including the, I mean, let's focus on the fact that just in the last month or so, we have learned of two instances, very credibly, where he, in all likelihood, violated the law in a fairly massive way. One was this tax fraud that was documented by the New York Times. The other was the fact that Michael Cohen, his personal attorney, implicated him in the commission of two federal crimes, violating federal campaign finance finance laws. And we're very blasé about that. But this is an unprecedented situation. We have a president who is essentially a crook, something we have not faced since the days of Watergate. But what makes this even more astonishing and dismaying is that there are no honest Republicans anymore, as there were in the days of Watergate, mm -hmm. who would hold this president accountable. And that leads me to conclude, and this is a point that I make in my book, as a somebody who is a lifelong Republican up until 2016, the only way Lawrence, we're going to get any accountability in Washington is if everybody who watches this show votes straight ticket Democratic. I have differences with Democrats, but we need to have accountability. We need to have checks and balances. We're not going to get it out of these Republicans who are Donald Trump's enablers. We need Democrats to get to the bottom of this and do things like, for example, getting his tax returns, which the chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee can do. But there is no way in hell that the Republican chairman is ever going to do that. And Joyce Vance, I want to get your reading of the long-awaited meeting with Rod Rosenstein today, which, as it happened, uh, took place on Air Force One. 
Interesting um, context, as you pointed out, given former Attorney General Loretta Lynch's well-known airport tarmac meeting with Bill Clinton. This meeting was nuanced a little bit differently, and of course, Rosenstein reports directly to the president on a number of matters, but it's hard to know what to make of this. Was it all theater designed to create some tension during the Kavanaugh process, or was the president really interested at one point in firing Rosenstein, but then pushed back from that? I think that that latter uh, explanation is more likely, because for this president firing Rosenstein and the impact that that could have had on narrowing and constricting the Mueller investigation could easily have been perceived as evidence of the intent to obstruct justice. Seems like the safer course for him is to make his peace with Rosenstein and, and work through it. And David, from the president, at minimum, got to show Rosenstein who is boss theoretically by ordering him to come on this plane ride with me and uh, spend some time talking to me there. Uh, but it could just be that the president is waiting until after election day to fire him. Um, right, because there's not a lot that Donald Trump wants Rob Rosenstein affirmatively to do. Right. There, th th there are things he wants him not to do. And, and so the, the test, the thing, the, the pulse check is, is this the day when uh, the president is pressuring Rob Rosenstein either to shut down Mueller or quit, and that, or be fired by someone who will? And that didn't happen today. And every day that that doesn't happen is a good day. David Frum, Max Boot, Joyce Vance, thank you all for joining us tonight. Thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on the button below for more from The Last Word and the rest of MSNBC.